Michael Betancourt is an artist, art historian, and critical theorist. He is currently a professor of motion media design at the Savannah College of Art and Design. He teaches the history of abstract film, motion graphics, and video art, and his essays have been translated into numerous languages. What follows is a critique of digital capitalism and the idea that the digital age has increased inequality rather than enhanced democracy. Capitalism means one and only one thing. And this is really the difference between people who work for a living and people who live off of all of the money that they make through their investments and don't actually have to collect a wage, don't have to work. Capitalism is about people who work externalizing their ability to make things, their productive capacity, and then exchanging it for a wage. That is the definition of what capitalism is. What happens in digital capitalism, and this is why the term digital capitalism is confusing to some people because they think they know what capitalism is. In digital capitalism, something entirely different is happening. In digital capitalism, what's happening is that instead of people externalizing their productive capacity, their productive capacity is replaced. They are automated away. Their jobs are turned into machines. And instead of externalizing their productive capacity, their productive capacity becomes a result of digital technology. Computers, automation, robots. These things become the productive capacity. And the people who formerly labored and worked for a wage are now so much surplus. They are no longer important. And so we have a really interesting paradox arising with the idea of digital capitalism, with this emergent new form of capitalism. And what that is is where capitalism is based fundamentally on this idea that workers exchange their labor for wages, which they then recycle. They spend the wages to buy the things that they make. In digital capitalism, suddenly you have people not being paid a wage, but still have to purchase things that are now made by these automated systems. And so in the early stages, which is what we've been living through for the last roughly 30 years, 40 years, is a transition and we are now at the point where we're starting to see technologically based unemployment. People's jobs are being replaced by automation, but there are no new jobs for them to shift into. As they were told, oh, just retrain, become something other than, than manufacturing, for example. Well, now the jobs that were not manufacturing jobs are being automated. And so, where you would train to be, say, an accountant and you would do people's taxes, now your job is being taken by Quicken and other automated programs. So what do those people retrain to do? And that's really the big question that confronts us economically. That's the question that confronts us as a society. And that's really the problem that digital capitalism poses for us. It is, it, it's a poor term. It's a description of an emergent system that has not yet fully emerged. We're in a period of transition. Digital capitalism depends upon this idea of an immaterial order. The immaterial is all of those things that you make, that you do, that you think, that you intellectually produce, like the idea of digital capitalism itself, but which do not involve physical production of any kind. And so things made by automated systems, generated by computers, for example, all of the data that is collected by, say, Google or Facebook or any of these companies, that automated collection of data is a form of immaterial labor. The generation of this database is immaterial labor. The values that this database has is the immaterial realm being made manifest in some fashion. So. That's the fundamental difference between digital production and the historical material production of 
industrial production, manual production, labor. The immaterial realm, the immaterial labor that produces this realm, the immaterial values that this realm creates, these are not physical values, but values that we can attribute to and attach to information. Values that don't depend upon the physical world so much as various kinds of intellectual labor. And with the automation of that labor in digital capitalism, people are basically out of luck. Their jobs are being automated out of existence. Their entire financial basis for survival is now in question. All values are imaginary. Value itself is a social relationship. Without a society saying this is valuable, value does not exist. Value depends entirely upon this social relationship. And so, without the realm of the social asserting value, making value tangible, without somebody who's willing to take your dollars, exchange whatever piece of script you have except your credit card, for instance, you have no ability to spend any money. That is totally and completely a social relationship. And this social relation is the foundation of value itself. Value is imaginary. It's a social relationship. But social relationships are real. They have real consequences. Social relationships are actually what constitute the material of the world that we inhabit. And so while it's easy to say, oh yes, it's an imaginary relation, all value is an illusion, the truth is, it's not. And this quest for value production without the need to expend any labor, without the need to expend resources, without the need to pay people to, for example, make things, means that value has a very real foundation. In the first decade of the new century, something very interesting happened. And everyone now talks about the housing bubble, the financial collapse, the so-called crisis, the end of the so-called crisis. What defines this particular bubble is really, in many ways, fairly straightforward. It's actually almost inevitable that this particular bubble emerged. Here's how it works. You have a bank, and the bank's business model becomes the reselling, the repackaging of the debt it generates. And this is where the bank is making its profits. Not, as you might expect, from interest, from payments made on or to debt, but by taking that debt and selling it to someone else. So we have a decade in which banks are no longer really being financed by making loans and then collecting money on those loans. Instead, what happens, and this is the so-called perverse incentive of this particular development, is it becomes in the bank's best interest to make and sell as many of these derivatives as possible, these repackaged loans. And so it no longer matters whether you have a down payment, whether you can make your payments, whether you are a good credit risk, whether you have credit, whether you are even necessarily alive. And so the bank just makes many loans. And in making these loans, they resell them and they repackage them. And they sell them to other banks. And the banks sell them to each other. And they sell them to other people. They sell them to pensions. They sell to private investors. They sell to governments. They sell to cities. They sell to countries. They keep selling them, and then they repackage what they've sold and resell those on and on and on and on in this incredible cycle of debt generation. So they all owe each other money. They all own each other's debt. And then the inevitable happens. The inevitable, of course, being that if you sell mortgages to people who can't pay them, they won't. And so we have the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, 2010, in which the entire system seems to be on the verge of collapse and the world as we know it, we are told, is going to come to an end. It, of course, does not end 
the world is still continuing much as it did. What happened instead is the various governments of the world stepped in, bailed out the insolvent banks, and enabled them to continue doing all of this by buying up all of these debts and then fronting the banks the money they need to continue doing some version of this particular financial scheme. This history is well known. There is really nothing new in what I have just said. The thing about this history is that it's a history in which the entire reason that this is happening is the shift from production to immaterial production. These derivatives, they're reselling the value that they have, the generation of the values, the churning of the values is automated. It happens because of the nature of the machines used to generate the values, to trade the values, and then run up the values in the various stock exchanges, financial markets, and so on around the world. This results in what we recognize instantly as digital capitalism in action through this entire crisis. And then when the crisis happens, there is one trillion dollars of outstanding mortgages. One trillion. But do the outstanding mortgages get bought? Do we talk about buying these outstanding mortgages? Does anyone even mention that the proximate cause of this is not the bank's repackaging of these mortgages, but the fact that the mortgages are not being paid off? The answer to that is no. And the reason for that is that digital capitalism, this aura of digital, strips away all of our concerns with the physical world, all of our concerns with the material basis of value, with the financial foundations in labor, in production, in people actually making things and being able to buy things. And it is instead in place with a concern entirely with the immaterial. And so the digital, anytime we think about the world today, we live in a digital world. We are not concerned with the physical things. We are concerned with their digital aura, the idea of what this is as a kind of perfect, immediately available, instantly accessible, right here for me, right now. There is no constraint. There is no limit. It's magical. And that is the fundamental condition under which we live. A society that is believing in the magic of this technology, this technology's ability to escape from the constraints of cost and labor and value and production, and instead replace it with this immaterial perfection where there is no scarcity. Everyone can have everything they want. Everyone can be rich. Everyone can be well-fed. Everyone can have whatever. Of course, the reality is we live in a constrained world. There are limited resources, there's limited money, there's limited time, there's limited audiences, there's limited everything. But the digital makes us forget that. The digital gives us this imaginary, perfect world in which we can all be kings. Capitalism is a system, and because it's a system, it has its own internal logic. The, the demands that it makes on everyone who lives within it, who acts within it, who, who thinks and believes and does within this system. And because it has these implicit demands that it makes on everyone involved with it, that means that it's possible to talk about a triumph of capitalism and it's possible to talk about the dissolution of capitalism. The beginning, the success, the collapse, as it were. Now, what's interesting about this particular system, capitalism, is that it's been with us for centuries. It's first described in the middle of the 19th century as such, even though it has earlier precedents. In the 20th century, the conflict between a kind of authoritarian fascist capitalism identified with the state, what we might call communism, what we might call fascism, and a free market or neoliberal variety of capitalism. This is the dominant conflict of the 20th century. As we move into the 21st century, things change slightly. This is what makes digital capitalism 
a distinct form from what we see in earlier forms of capitalism that we've studied in school, which are familiar, which we know well. With digital capitalism, and this is what makes it the triumph of classically conceived capitalism, we have a whole series of things coming together. We have the ability to eliminate the various intermediaries between conception and product. We have the ability to eliminate all of those elements that would impact our ability to make profit, like the limitations of labor, the limitations of resources, the scarcity of markets, by shifting as much of our production into an immaterial realm, not constrained in the same ways as physical production, which is what has happened with digital capitalism. This is what makes it the triumph of classically conceived capitalism. The dissolution comes from how the financial dimensions work out. Because without the labor being paid to purchase its own products, that is to say labor having the financial means to buy the products of labor, jobs, security, and so forth, what we find is capitalism itself suddenly comes into question in a way that it never was in the 20th century at all. The world of communism, the world of fascism, and the world of the various liberal and neoliberal economies are all very much the same. They are founded on an idea of people working, being paid for their labor, and then spending that money back into the economy. With digital capitalism, this capacity itself comes into question. The ability to have a job suddenly becomes a luxury, even though it is still a necessity for survival. The ability to buy things becomes a luxury, even though it is still a necessity for survival. There is no one handing out free food, free housing, free clothing, any of the various things that we assume are essential to our survival. Labor is the foundation of the entire capitalist system. It is the foundation of what we might call the communist system or the fascist system. Whichever system you want to call it, none of these provide what under capitalism, under contemporary society, might be called a free lunch. No one is given a salary simply for being alive. No one is guaranteed housing or food or shelter or health care or take your pick of any possible things that you think you might need simply because you are human and you live. That means all of these societies are in some condition capitalist in nature because the workers are externalizing their productive capacity and being paid for it. The idea that a CEO needs to be paid 400 times more per year or 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 more than the lowest paid person in their employee is because the CEO has agency. The CEO makes decisions. The person who is mopping the floor, the janitor, does not make decisions that impact what the company does, how the company makes money. That is exclusively the domain of the very highly paid executives. And this is why they are highly paid. Capitalism itself is based on the idea of human agency as the defining feature of humanity. In that regard, capitalism is an expression of the Enlightenment civilization that has dominated the world for the last 500 years. Capitalism depends upon this notion of agency as the sole repository of value. This is why workers externalize their productive capacity. They are selling their agency, their ability to make things, their unique human quality that until very recently no device of any kind actually had. With the emergence of the digital, the possibility of the autonomous machine, whether it's your cell phone listening to you talk to it and following your instructions and getting you whatever you want, to the car that drives itself, to the machine that makes trades in a fraction of an instant on the financial market, every one of these is a machine with agency. They are doing things that until those machines were invented, only human beings could do. And that is why when we encounter the digital, 
we are encountering something entirely new. The entire foundation of capitalism is in question. The entire structure of human society as we know it now is in question as well. I know when we talk about a CEO and the vast wage that he is receiving, that it might be natural to assume that the problem is the difference between the CEO's wage and the everyday labor's wage. But that's not really what the problem here is. Somebody being paid more or even a whole lot more isn't really the issue although certainly it is a reflection of the underlying cause. The real problem is the idea that the only people who matter are those who have agency, those who make the decisions, those whose decisions are the decisions that matter. Because it is that idea that has enshrined the idea of automation at all costs, that anything that can be automated will be automated should be automated, must be automated. This notion of automation as the solution to the problems inherent in the distinction between making something and planning something and having someone else make it, because when you have somebody else do what you're telling them to, they're going to do it not necessarily the way that you would. And that distinction is the reason that we have this shift towards absolute agency for the CEOs and the people in charge, that they get paid more than everyone else because they deserve it, because their decisions matter. And the janitor, the person working at fast food, the person working at Walmart, does not matter in consequence because their decisions do not impact the actual company's value. Not really in the way that the CEO's choices do. That difference is a reflection of this shift towards automation, this emphasis on the immaterial, this dissolution of physical production entirely. This is what digital capitalism authorizes. This is the fundamental condition of capitalism itself. It's what makes capitalism what it is the worker externalizing their productive capacity, their agency, and then receiving a wage in exchange for it. So when we have this transition, which we're currently living through, the end of capitalism, at least as we know it, the question then becomes, what comes next? There are a variety of options. Some of them are good. Some of them are not good. Some of them sound like dystopian science fiction from the 20th century. Some of them sound like pure fantasy. Some of them sound like they couldn't possibly be financially viable. And yet all of them are possibilities. And we're living through the moments when what the future looks like will be determined by the choices we all make, each and every one of us, whether we are the CEO or not, whether we are powerful politically, socially, economically, where we are disempowered. What we each decide to do as a society is a collective decision. And how we decide to shape the future collectively is what determines which of the various potentials we could have. In one, it makes something like George Orwell's 1984 look like a positive future, better than what we would have. A future in which everything we do is monitored, everything we do has been commercialized, everything is a matter of commercial exploitation. Everything, to ma perhaps make it even worse, has been turned into a game so that we are more likely to do it. Imagine, if you will, a society in which everything you do is monitored. How many times you brush your teeth, how many strokes you use on each tooth is monitored. If you do 30 per tooth, you get one badge. If you do 40, you get another badge. If you do 50, you get another badge. If you spend five minutes versus 10 minutes brushing your teeth, you get different badges. And these badges translate into real financial rewards for you. You get discounts on the toothpaste that you're using in order to win those badges. And the way that this has been accomplished is that every action you take everywhere at any moment during the entire day, every day of your life, 
is monitored, is surveilled, is kept track of. And then you receive valuable cash prizes for it. This is, in effect, what you get when you add gamification to what you do with Facebook right now. There are people who are proposing the idea of gamification who are using this as an example of what they're actually suggesting we do with our society. This is not an accidental or fantasy suggestion. This is a real proposition that's been made. But the result is you have a society that somehow looks like George Orwell's 1984, but without Big Brother being the evil government. It instead becomes a myriad of corporations that exist to exploit you financially. Then when you add something like the NSA as a superstructure behind all of this, the notion that you have any kind of choice, any kind of free will becomes purely an illusion. There are already examples of the results in Google affecting results in elections in different parts of the world, like in Pakistan or in India. If Google gives you a negative search result for your candidate, your candidate might lose. That is real political power. And who's to say that we don't have a government at some point in the future deciding they want to engineer their own democratic maintenance in a way that makes the single option voting of today's capitalists or communists or fascist regimes look positively uncontrolled by comparison. It's easy to imagine negative futures, dystopian futures. We have decades of fantasy novels in the form of science fiction giving us models for this. We have literally thousands of these novels. We have movies that have made their way into the popular imagination. Something like Blade Runner, for instance, or The Matrix, that give us a negative, horrific future dominated by machines in one fashion or another. But these are not the only possibilities. The issue really is not do we have this inevitable future of environmental collapse, degradation, financial insecurity, people starving, living in the streets, and the world that looks something like the world of Make Room, Make Room, popularly known as the film Soylent Green. Or do we have a world that is somewhat different? No matter what happens, it will not be the world that we live in today. That is the only certainty change. That's always been the case, that things change. But we as a society have the option to choose something different. The Swiss are currently engaged in an experiment that is showing us what one of these possibilities might be like. The Swiss have decided to guarantee every citizen of their country a monthly income, a certain level that everyone receives simply for existing simply for being alive and a citizen and human in their country. And this monthly income allows for a whole variety of things. It's well above what we would call poverty line here in the United States. And this is a guarantee that has been written into their constitution, as far as I know. That was my understanding, at least, that that was the referendum. But even if it's only the force of law, the sheer notion that you are alive, you are human, you deserve housing, shelter, health care, financial security, a modicum of stability. Now imagine a country the size of the United States or Russia or China doing something similar with its entire population. Because you are alive and you are human, you are guaranteed certain things. And we're not talking about abstract rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. We are talking about what you need to achieve those abstract rights. And there are a variety of examples of these. We can easily summarize what would be required. Secure food, secure shelter, personal security, the worry that you are not going to be killed or murdered in your sleep or while you are awake. The lack of fear just living. A society structured in this fashion where no one actually has to work. Imagine that a society in which work becomes the luxury rather than the necessity. Certainly in such a society, people would pay to have jobs. And you can imagine that the wealthiest among us would be employed while everyone else would not. 
But such a society does not resemble the one in which we live in any real or substantive fashion other than there are people in it going about their lives. In some ways it would probably be very familiar. In others it would be entirely alien. This is not the world of a fantasy like Star Trek. And that's really the danger, are these compliant fantasies that encourage and feed into our collective beliefs in the world. Because everyone who watches Star Trek, who believes in Star Trek, who dresses up in their Star Trek uniforms and goes to Star Trek conventions, forgets one very simple fact about Star Trek. Everyone is in the army. Star Trek is the military. If you want a different future, you must begin by imagining one in which the fundamental condition of your existence is changed. And that's an existence in which you have the right to live. You have the right to food. You have the right to housing. You have the right to health care. You have the right to all the things that you need to exist because you are human. The reason we have built all of these technologies, the reason we invented our societies and our cultures and our civilization is not to make a small number of people fantastically wealthy but to enable the survival of everyone to improve the life of everyone to make everyone better healthier stronger smarter more successful at being whatever it means to be human the various theories ideas proposals that I've been making that we've been talking about today are diagnostic in nature. They are diagnostic because if we want to have a different future, we want to imagine something other than where we are now, we must begin by knowing how we got here, what the conditions of the present are, what makes our world be and act and function the way it does. This fundamental need, diagnostic, is what informs the kind of critique that I'm calling the critique of digital capitalism. And that is the underlying purpose of all of the things that I'm proposing in relation to digital capitalism. We need to know how we got here, why things work the way they do now, if we want to challenge their foundations, if we want to do something entirely different, or continue and make things exactly the way they're going to be if we don't otherwise engaged.